Well, hello there. You are watching the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages. Time then to see what's making the headlines with the Daily Mirror's associate editor, Kevin McGuire, and the Telegraph's deputy comment editor, Annabel Denham. Welcome to both of you. Great to see you. So let's take a look at the front pages, shall we? Let's start with the eye, leading with fears that the government's bill aimed at ending the flow of small boats crossing the Channel could jeopardise the landmark Windsor Agreement made with the EU last week. That story is also the lead for The Guardian, Sunak facing a clash with the European Union, it says. Daily Mail examining the possibility of BBC presenter Gary Lineker losing his job over remarks he made about the new asylum plan. But The Mirror quotes Lineker as saying he will never be silenced. The Telegraph reports that at the height of the pandemic, the former health secretary, Matt Hancock, was advised to tone down his claims that the COVID virus originated in a Chinese lab over fears it could spoil British relations with Beijing. The Metro has word of the christening of Harry and Meghan's daughter, Princess Lilibet, and the fact she'll somewhat unexpectedly be using that title. The Times reporting on the revolutionary new weight loss drug for the NHS, which could lead to a cut in the country's benefits bill. The Financial Times understands that the government plans to tackle shortages in the labour market by loosening rules surrounding foreign workers in the construction sector. And the Daily Star has the story of a profane parrot. Well, a reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us, or our guests more specifically. So let's head straight to Kevin Maguire and Annabel Devon. Well, uh, welcome to both of you. Um, so, uh, the repercussions then of the asylum bill. Uh, the Guardian then, Kevin. Uh, Sunak facing a clash with the European Union. What's happening? The EU beginning to react to it, are they? Yeah, maybe the illegal migration bill, as it's called, should be called the illegal illegal migration bill, because the clash here is with the European Union, the Home Affairs Commissioner. Is it Eva Johansson? Is that how I pronounce her name? As I said, she, uh, she spoke to Suella Braverman, the Home Secretary, on Tuesday and said they thought it was uh, un unlawful. But Braverman pushed back, said not, but we now know that she thinks that uh, Odds are that it will uh, fall foul of the European Convention of uh, Human Rights, which for all the angry, swivel-eyed Brextremists uh, is not the same as the European uh, Court of Justice or anything to do with the European Union. Uh, but so it, it's unfortunate for the Prime Minister in the UK at the very least when he seemed to be resetting relations with the European Union through the uh, the Windsor framework to uh, resolve problems around the, uh, the, the Brexit... Um, uh, uh, relationship in Northern Ireland, the protocol that this is this has come along, and I think this this bill, uh, as the Guardian points uh, points out on its front page, uh, some people just think it's uh, cynical, really, to get the to get the issue up in politics and for the election rather than actually resolving the the problem of uh, of boat crossings, refugees, asylum, and migration. Yes, and the Guardian saying the Home Secretary disagreed with the Commissioner and asked her to read the detail of the bill once it was published. That's a, a source close to Braverman speaking to the Guardian. Uh, all of this, of course, ahead of a summit between President Macron and Rishi Sunak on Friday. But the eye going, in a sense, slightly further as well. Uh, Sunak's small boats bill ri risks Brexit peace with Europe. O all that good work done with Ursula von der Leyen, um, undone, um, you know, within, within a few days, it seems, Annabelle. Well, it certainly does. I mean, I think that Rishi Sunak probably expected that taking a harder line approach to tackling the migrant crisis would risk slightly damaging relations with Europe, which, of course, as you say, have thawed significantly since the announcement of the Windsor framework. He and Emmanuel Macron are meeting for a, a reasonably important summit uh, in Paris, and it'll be interesting to see uh, the body language um, there and how that, that meeting goes. But I think, you know, Rishi Sunak made this one of his um, five pillars. This is one of the promises that he's trying to make uh, to the British public um, in the run-up to the next general election. He will know that this won't have been uh, easy. I suspect there's a high chance that this stalls before it makes any progress uh, at all, even if it makes it through the Commons. Will it make it through the Lords? And even make it through the Lords, will it make it uh, through the courts? Um, you know, this, this issue of asylum has been a Gordian knot, and Home Secretaries have tied themselves in it 
for years. You know, who doesn't want to offer asylum to those who fear persecution in their homelands, who are fleeing from war-torn countries? Um, it's also, I think, difficult to object to anyone wanting to improve their lives and the lives of their families by coming here as economic migrants. But the increase in the number of people coming here from a few hundred in 2018 to tens of thousands last year um, is, is deeply troubling and an issue that many voters care about deeply. So it, it's not altogether surprising that Sunak is looking to address this. And I think it's quite interesting that the Labour Party are not really objecting to this on compassionate grounds, but rather battling with the Conservatives over who has a better idea of how to stop the boats. Yes, and certainly you've got the impression that uh... Rishi Sunak and the Conservatives have done focus groups on this, the way he was speaking at Prime Minister's Questions, you know, we're speaking for the people of Britain, etc., etc. Um, but the eye picking up on that summit on Friday with Emmanuel Macron, uh, suggesting he will demand annual multi-million pound payments to prevent people illegally crossing the channel. Uh, the Treasury signalling, the paper says, it will increase cash for policing beaches. The Times also reporting that Macron will demand annual UK payments to tackle the small boats crisis. It's going to cost us a lot of money, this cooperation with Europe, isn't it, Kevin? Uh, well, it is, well, it is. And, of course, we're, we're no longer part of the, the Dublin Convention, whereby people could be sent back to uh, the country from which they'd arrived in the, in the European Union. That doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and, yes, it will it will cost money, but there's, there's no easy solution to, to, to this problem. It is a problem. People coming over on, on boats, they're risking, their, they're risking their lives. They arrive unlawfully, but there are no safe and legal routes often uh, for them to apply. And so many, uh, the majority of people, once they get here, they are allowed to stay because they have legitimate claims. It's, uh, the government wants to use the channel as a moat to stop them making those claims in the first place. That's, that's it. And you can, you can do that by stopping the, stopping the sailings. Uh, and then once they arrive, if you do reject them, then you need agreements to, to send them elsewhere. Rwanda was never really more than something to wave around because it, it, would never, it would never take the numbers. But it's also quite interesting, Anna, that the whole focus from the government appears to be on boats, which is 45,000 last year. Uh, uh, the Home Secretary is saying projections this year it could be 80,000 unless they're stopped. Net migration in the UK last year was 504,000, uh, a record. But the government almost wants nobody to see that and question it as it, as it uh, focuses almost entirely on the, on the boats as an issue because it can see electoral uh, advantage from doing that and uh, hopefully embarrassing, uh, embarrassing Labour. You're spotting a diversionary tactic there, are you, Kevin? But in the meanwhile... Uh, well, it Annabelle, is, yeah. Uh, well, go to yeah. the Daily Mail. Uh, it's about Lineker. It was again last night for them. You know, look at the banner headlines along the top there. Staff are boiling with anger at the star's disdain for rules they obey. He fails to apologise for the Nazi slur. Beeb crisis talks as insiders say he's passed a tipping point. Should he, as a sports presenter, be allowed to speak out? That's been the question today. Yes, and I think Gary Lineker has gone to some lengths to try and make this a uh, free speech uh, issue. Um, of course, uh, you know, for viewers who perhaps haven't been watching the news over the last 24 hours, uh, this is uh, Gary Lineker um, comparing the illegal migrant bill to uh, 1930s Germany and the language uh, used within that bill um, to 1930s Germany. It's caused a huge amount of outrage, um, not least that it downplays the persecution of uh, Jewish people under Hitler. Uh, but also, and that's what this story is really focusing on, is that it undermines the impartiality uh, of the BBC. We know that when the new T B BBC Director General Tim Davey came in, uh, he launched a crusade on BBC impartiality. And I think you know, he's now under a lot of pressure uh, to sack Gary Lineker to take a hard, uh, tough approach um, uh, to the, these tweets. Um, and now Gary Lineker has actually doubled down, which is only going to further intensify uh, that pressure. Um, at the moment, we're being told that the BBC is going to have a frank uh, conversation with the um, Match of the Day uh, presenter. Um, to my mind, these comments weren't uh, reasonable, and I suspect that they might go against the BBC's social media guidelines, which would uh, insist on uh, impartiality for uh, reporters, but also for uh, presenters, even if they 
are tweeting in their own name. Let's not forget that Gary Lineker is famous because of the BBC. He has uh, millions of followers on Twitter because of the role that the BBC uh, has given him, which would in large part be paid for um, by a levy on the British population, the licence fee. So you can see why so many BBC employees and the wider public are incensed by this. And I think Tim Davies, as I say, is in a very difficult uh, position and it will be interesting to see what, what decision is made in the coming days. Yes, your paper also um, kicking off with this as well, Kevin. Lineker, I will never be silenced. Um, the problem for the BBC and what ties their hands a bit is this question of impartiality is yeah. very critical with a Tory government in power. You know, the likes of Nadine Doris, it's been an undermining if, in effect of the BBC um, and the part they play in, in news and so on. So this, this, is, this has become very important for, for them. Yeah, no, it, no, it has. It, look, my own paper, the Daily Mirror, is far more sympathetic to uh, Gary Lineker than the the Mail, which seems to be salivating and hoping he is is sacked. But you're quite you're quite right. It is very difficult for for the BBC and Tim Davey if he's laying down the law and it is being defined. Now, of course, in Lineker's defence, it would be that he is in sport; he's not in news or current affairs. So you could argue that's rather rather different. But he's been criticised once before. Uh, over a, a challenge in trust when she was foreign secretary and she said uh, the uh, Champions League final should be, shouldn't be in Russia. In the end, it was in Paris. A uh, disaster for Liverpool fans who were treated appallingly. Nevertheless, it was, it was in Paris rather than Russia. And he said, well, is the Tory party going to give the, uh, the Russian donations back? So, no, it's, it's very, very, diff very difficult. The, the Tory party always says the BBC is a, a hotbed of lefties and liberals, uh, overlooking the fact David Cameron and Boris Johnson both got their uh, press secretaries from uh, from the BBC, a lot of people from the BBC go go and work for the Tories in uh, in power, but it but it is difficult now. Lineker himself, when he was talking about the 1930s Germany, he wasn't talking about concentration camps. He's talking about the dehumanisation of people, and he was actually echoing a Holocaust survivor who co confronted the Home Secretary herself back in January and made that very very point. But there's no there's no doubt once you raise the spectre of um, of Hitler and the Nazis. Any uh, any controversy uh, you know, goes to warp speed immediately. And just on the you know asylum uh, story itself, many people say, why not put them to work while they're here? We've got a shortage of workers. And sort of connected to that, but different, is the FT's front page um, that the ministers are planning to tackle chronic shortages in the labour market by opening the door to more foreign workers, starting with looser rules for the construction sector. Would you welcome this? Because certainly sectors have been calling for this, have they not, Annabelle? Yes, that's right. So as you say, this is the news that the government wants to tackle these labour market shortages, which we've been experiencing really since the economy reopened after uh, lockdown. Um, and they're going to do this by loosening rules for foreign workers, particularly in the construction centre, uh, construction sector, but really looking at those areas uh, where the shortages are uh, chronic and, and most acute. Of course, at the same time, ministers are looking to tackle inactivity, but they've yet to come up with anything resembling a workable uh, solution. Some of the ideas floated included job coaches being posted at GP surgeries or no income tax for uh, the over 50s, the latter of which elicited reasonable outcry uh, that it was exacerbating an intergenerational uh, inequality. But of course, what we have here is in the very same week that Rishi Sunak is announcing this, uh, his intention to clamp down on uh, illegal immigration. Um, ministers are now contemplating targeted immigration to plug those shortages. Um, as for the shortage occupation, list I'm I'm quite skeptical about this um you know this allows this will allow employers to bring in staff on a lower salary threshold and with lower visa fees um, that when we started uh, experiencing those shortages after COVID, um, jobs like artists were on there when chefs weren't, even though we had a shortage of, I think, around 30,000 chefs uh, at the time. And I think this really underscores that businesses require a variety of workers with a range of skills and salary expectations. And those Annabelle. businesses and the people in them are better placed than Whitehall to decide what they need.